who is the Dean of the School of Public Health here at the University of North Carolina. She's also the Alumni Distinguished Professor uh, in Public Health. And uh, we thank you for taking some time to uh, uh, talk with us this afternoon. Glad to be here. So, uh, to begin with, uh, let's talk a little bit about the way that you think about information in what you do. And you can describe okay. uh, what you do as a dean okay. uh, or also uh, as a researcher uh, and professor. Uh, but uh, I think lately your, your uh, attention has been on uh, the deanly duties. Absolutely. You know, Gary, when you sent me the email about doing this, it made me really start to think about information and how I use information. And um, I think every job I've had has broadened the kinds of information that I need and in some ways the urgency of information. And um, in this job, I need so many different kinds of information and I need it often really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I find that, um, that over time I've broadened the number of types of sources, you know, so, you know, uh, I not only read Science and Harvard Business Review and Wall Street Journal and a couple other papers, including the New York Times, but um, you know, being able to monitor what's happening in new technologies and what's happening in different kinds of science. And it's it's really amazing how much we have to have at our fingertips. One one example that might illustrate um, how I use information as a teen comes from a recent um, foray that we made um, to try to get a large gift that would end up in naming the school. And it was successful. But we had um, a group of faculty who were meeting and, uh, and talking about some possibilities. And I brought them some ideas, including the idea of creating innovation laboratories. And we wanted to know as a result of that dis discussion, which they thought, you know, these are really cool and, and this sounds mm -hmm. some, something very promising, but who else is doing this? Or, you know, is this going to be something that's passe or is this something that is, um, uh, is right out on the forefront? And so we came out of that meeting and we said, one of the things we're going to do is, is to collect information. And so a person who works for me said, I'm on top of this. I'm, um, I'm going to go out and get this information. And this really had to roll fast. And the next day I said to him, so how are you working on this? And he said, well, I went and I asked a librarian to do a search. And um, I said, well, tell me a little bit about the search terms that you used. And I got a little bit nervous, not because a librarian can't do a great search, because they can, but it's, every, it's all about what you give them. Right. And, um, and so I, I wasn't very comfortable about his search. So about 10 o'clock at night I said, I, I've got to get on top of this and the only way I'm going to get on top of it is to go out and look for information. And so I did what any halfway intelligent person would do in this day and age, which is I did a Google search. You know? And so I started, I was particularly interested in ways of organizing for innovation. And I, what really struck me as I was searching is, um, is how quickly I was able to find out what was being done in other countries. So I got EU reports and what was being done in Ireland and what was being done in, in Thailand and as well as what was being done in the United States. And very quickly I was able to get kind of a picture of what was happening. And, and you know what I have to do as a dean is to be able to sort through information very quickly and synthesize it and try to get a picture. And without the internet, this would have taken weeks. You know, I mean, it was really that ability to have almost instant processing of in information and, and real-time data. Um, but then I still felt, well, I'm not sure this is quite enough of, um, of what I need. And so then I did the other thing that everybody does, which is I went and did an Amazon search, you know, mm -hmm. looking for books on innovation. But by the next day, I had six books on innovation that were, you know, delivered to my home, and I was able to um, to start reading them. And I think, you know, that's really one of the hallmarks of information management now for people at all levels is the ability not only to go out and find information, to find the right information, to find it quickly, but to use different, you know, to use computer mediated information to use the internet but also we still read books you know and magazines and newspapers and and so we're taking in information from all sources now that a couple of days later I said to the person who had done the search or had asked the person to do the search so let me see what you have and it was all wrong because it was it was because the person was asked to use the wrong terms they were asked to do a search of interdisciplinary teams which is not what it was right. about at all and if i had waited for that information it would have been completely useless 
And so I think one of the ways in which my sense is that information management, if I can use that broadly, has changed is that in the old days, a dean probably would have asked somebody else to find the information and synthesize right. it. And they might not have had the tools to do it themselves, but my sense is that more and more of us now are managing our own information needs and controlling our own access to information and feeling like that's the only way in which you can feel complete, and maybe I'm just conveying myself as a completely type A person, but, um, <laughs> but as a way to feel confident that you've really gotten the information that you need. And, um, yeah. and I, I think that that's just one example, but it helped me to get what I needed to be able to stand behind a request for $50 million that was in the end successful. Right. Um, but it was, it was knowing that I was asking for something that really was novel um, and that I had gone to a lot of trouble to make sure that it was. This is really uh, uh, interesting uh, to, to hear that uh, someone with, with uh, set time constraints is able to rather quickly and proficiently find really valuable information. And, and I think that's, it's, a, it's a nice example of how things have changed in, in our, um, uh, our, our sort of modern times. Uh, also explains why I get emails from you at uh, 3 a.m. <laughs> yes, where you're also on doing email. We've stopped sleeping. Right. Um, how, how have um, the, the, the roles that information pl play and, and also the way that information is accessed uh, affected uh, health uh, and, and public health in particular? I mean, has, that, has this also uh, been a change? Tremendous, in tremendous. Yeah. So, uh, so it's affected it on multiple levels. One is the level of the consumer who mm -hmm. now has, as you know, more mm -hmm. information than ever before. Now that may seem daunting, but it's also tremendously empowering. And, you know, a group of us have been studying how patients use internet mailing lists for mm -hmm. cancer information. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it is clear that people are using that information not just to know more about their diseases, but to make decisions about their diseases, to go look for second opinions. Um, and it's mm -hmm. changing the face of, of patient information. So there's that side of it. There's people using the internet um, and, uh, and all that the internet leads them to, to be just more informed consumers, um, to know about how to stop smoking or how to, or how to change a diet. Um, one of our professors is, um, is becoming increasingly well known and has been very successful in developing weight loss, pro weight loss programs mm -hmm. delivered over the internet. Um, you know, when we are dependent on people coming in to a program, we can only reach a small number of people. But when we can deliver a program using the internet, then really scale is, is almost unimaginable. You know, we oh, can reach yeah. millions and millions of people. Right. So it's changing both how consumers get information, how patients get information, but also our concept of who our target population is. You know, I think in the yeah. old days, who did we think about reaching? They were the people that we could get to physically, you know, that mm -hmm. we could recruit into studies, um, you know, a certain number of work sites or, right. or community organizations or whatever. Right. But now we can imagine a, a global population of people who want to lose weight, who aren't yeah physically housed in an area that we can reach but are but want something that we can offer and I think that's um, that's really changing public health in very dramatic ways and then there are other ways that you know that we've talked about some and that's um, thinking about how you monitor how you how you do surveillance of data um, mm -hmm. so that you can find the anomalies you know so that if you're looking for um, a possible new epidemic that you can collect data from emergency rooms as, mm -hmm. as this university does in conjunction with the State Department of Health and then have people who are constantly probing to look mm -hmm. for those, you know, those blips that might indicate terrorism or, or some other kind of potentially lethal threat. Right. And I think in all those ways, information is dramatically different. Um, you know, we have more information in general in some ways, it's easier to use. In some ways, there's so much more of it that I think we haven't even begun to figure out how to, how to use it well. Um, it's more accessible to consumers. Um, we're more accessible to consumers in some ways. Um, 
Um, and, um, and it's also changed how we view colleagues, so people can, you know, write to you from all over the world who want to collaborate, and I'm sure you've experienced that, you know, the, um, um, and it brings you new relationships, it also, you know, makes life much more complicated in so many ways. So it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's a tremendous challenge, and it's a very, it's a very exciting time because of that, because our horizons have, have shifted so much. I mean, in public health, in contrast to medicine, we, we talk about reaching people millions at a time. Right. And with the internet, we actually can think about reaching people millions at a time. But it also means we have to really think differently about the products that we develop and, and, and think about creating for scale instead of yeah. for very small, finite research projects. That's, that's really fascinating. Uh, I, public health has, uh, of course, had tremendous uh, influence on, on the overall uh, health of the, of, the, of the human population in, in the last hundred years, and, and this uh, sounds like uh, uh, another big uh, change coming here where the changing health behavior really matters a lot. So this idea of crafting different kinds of messages for these broader audiences. Are there people who are working on, on sort of uh, new ways to craft Absolutely. information messages to, to yeah. people? And, uh, yeah. I mean, this school has actually been one of the leaders in an area we call tailored health messaging. Ah, okay. And so people like Marcy Campbell and Alice Ammerman and, um, and Vic Strecker, who started mm -hmm. here in, with a communications lab, and Matt Kruder, who was mm -hmm. a student here. Um, Celeste Skinner, who started here, um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of my work has been in that right. area, and um, and the idea is that if you can use information about people that comes from people that is relevant to them, mm -hmm. um, and that you provide um, materials or tools back to them in ways that reflect their own, say, barriers to changing diet or quitting smoking, instead of generic ones that we're more likely to be successful. And um, right. while the data are not unequivocal, it does seem that in some areas of behavior change, it is more effective to give people to, you know, tip information, which is not surprising. I mean, right. you know, would you rather read a generic brochure? Or would you rather read one that's about Gary? I mean, you know, most of us would yeah. rather read about ourselves of in course, some way. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of work going mm -hmm. on, a lot of funding. Um, and, you know, I think some of the challenges are really trying to get the right information about people. It's not that hard to get information, mm -hmm. but what is it that's going mm -hmm. to change your behavior? And I think exactly. we're, um, we're not nearly as good about that as we are about, you know, about collecting information in general. And how do you link right. that to healthcare sources? And we've yeah. talked about you know, personal health records and, mm -hmm. um, and electronic medical records, and how do we then leverage those kind of data sources without invading privacy? You know, I think the minute you start talking about medical information and health information, we then get into territory that risks being able to put together too good a picture about people. Absolutely, you anticipated my <laughs> next question in terms yes. of how do you balance that that need to understand people's needs so that mm -hmm. you can be better tailor information yes. to their yes. needs and yet to respect their privacy and confidentiality. You know, I think we're we're really on, only on in the beginning of understanding how to do mm -hmm. that. Some of it may be individual specific, where people mm -hmm. may have different tolerances. Um, people with very serious life-threatening diseases, we found, may be much more willing for us to disclose information than people right. who, you know, want to change a behavior like smoking or their behaviors that are socially sanctioned so that if somebody mm -hmm. is worried about AIDS or right. drug abuse, then, yeah. you know, then you may have to take extra caution. And, and mm -hmm. it's an area where ethics and uh, is, you know, just really is important and we have to be respectful of information because information is is potentially dangerous. I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. you know, it's a tremendously powerful, possibly beneficial um, item if you want to mm -hmm. think about that, but it also has tremendous power to harm and, and you know, I think we have right. to come to grips with that and realize that, you know, that we have to think about information as a potent force. That's fascinating. I hadn't thought about um, sort of information as kind of uh, analogous to to drugs. Mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, something that can you know, sort of save your life or end your life, uh, uh, depending on how it's used. Right? But so it's a nice way to think about it. And I think if you think about for different kinds of mm -hmm. people, different information can be helpful or harmful. That, right. 
um, and who would you want to have that information about you? You know, I think that's something we have to learn how to respect also. And we're just, you know, I think we're just beginning to get into these areas, but, you know, it's, today's students are definitely going to have to grapple with these things. Right. Because we have the potential to create hugely tailored information, including, mm -hmm. you know, in the not too distant future information about your genetics on a chip that could be given to, to people in mm -hmm. health communication. And, um, and, you know, we could then mm -hmm. tell you about your uh, propensity for certain diseases and, you know, do you want to know mm -hmm. that and who do you want us to share it with and can somebody else log on to your computer and right. get it? Um, you know, I, those are all questions that have to be answered yeah. in ways we have to protect the people who trust us. And so how, how do you deal with that in, in your curriculum? Uh, it, it, are there courses that deal with ethics or is it integrated throughout different courses? Uh, it's, um, you know, when um, public health changed their competencies a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and, and it is expected now that all students will have some exposure to ethics. Okay. So we have courses in ethics. Um, we also have a new certificate in, eth in public mm -hmm. health ethics that students can take, um, but that's just uh, been released. Mm -hmm. I don't think we pay enough attention to it though. I mean, mm -hmm. I think particularly the ethics of information and information mm -hmm. disclosure, I think we've only, you know, we tend to think of it as IRBs or HIPAA. Right. I think it's much yes. broader than that. Okay. You know, I think the, the potential of information to be disclosed in ways that will harm people, I think mm -hmm. we haven't really thought about nearly as much. So it's, it's something we have to grapple with. I mean, do you? Do you teach ethics in, we, in we, ILS? We have we have an eth one ethics course, uh, and then other it, it's it's integrated into other classes. But uh, I agree, it's it's not something that is uh, stressed as much as it certainly uh, uh, should be in, in today's world. Um, if I could shift the sure. uh, to, to uh, an, another topic, uh, the in, from a public health sense. Uh, What's the role of libraries in this kind of new world we live in? Uh, do, you, do you see? It's a good question. This? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, unlike people of my generation yeah. who grew up, we went to physical libraries, mm -hmm. and um, and the library played a very different mm -hmm. role. I mean, the library was where you studied. For our students, right. li they use the library all the time, but they use libraries virtually. You know, so mm -hmm. um, that they're using Uncle and they're using all the references in the virtual library, but they're right. not physically going there. Although they do enjoy the coffee there, so you know, <laughs> right. that's the, yes. the modern library. Yeah. Um, but libraries play a very important role in communities, and mm -hmm. a number of people, including, you know, a collaboration with Marcy Campbell and, uh, and Dr. Gallup at your school mm -hmm. and Barbara Wildermuth, tried to use libraries as ways to reach people with health information. And mm -hmm. I think we haven't even begun to really tap into that, particularly in low-income mm -hmm. communities and countries. And, you know, I think we're still, we still tend to think about the U.S. And yet, when I talk to people in Kenya and other countries where a medical library consists of a few textbooks and, um, you know, and not even thinking about the virtual library that they could have of millions of books, right. but they're still aiming to get, you know, a bigger physical library. And how do we help people around the world get access to information both from libraries and other sources as we as we work with them. I think it's something that is a real public health task that right. needs to be done in concert with people who are from library sciences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, libraries are also used in communities to provide people with access to the internet for health information, and a lot of people get their health information that way, you know, who don't own computers, and who really count on librarians to help mentor or guide them through the informa information seeking pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think librarians are, you know, are more relevant than ever, but they, in public health, we, pro we probably see them more as having changed their mission from, um, you know, really helping people who come into the library to be more proactive and reaching out into communities and helping people whose skills may not be as sophisticated to get information to libraries. And then I think, you know, some of the tools that we have here in our health sciences library, tools of collaboration and tools of really helping people to go beyond, you know, mere searching to much better searching. Um, you know, I think 
in a way, because it's so easy to do things like search, we tend to maybe not develop as good of processes of how to do that as, as we might if we really engage with librarians, you know, helping to package information differently. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, um, what, one of, the, one of the, the big debates that uh, uh, especially the younger students uh, I run into uh, sort of bring is the role of, of libraries in the future. And uh, of course, they're quite concerned about that mm -hmm. because their livelihoods will depend upon it. But uh, uh, you've certainly given us uh, I think there some good hope. Are plenty of roles. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, and also helping people, you know, like in in schools like mine, to really package information and and synthesize. So, so uh, I have one more kind of general topic. Uh, it has to do with just the way information flows. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, can you, so how do you manage uh, information? I mean, you, you talked about uh, reading multiple newspapers and journals uh, in, in almost you know, multiple fields, mm -hmm. uh, uh, databases. Uh, I mean, how do you manage to stay on, on top of this, besides oh. not sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm convinced that I'm not on top of it anymore, yeah. which is very uh, frustrating. Yeah. Um, um, you know, there are months I see my communication journals mm -hmm. that are piling up. Um, one of the ways I manage it is by participating in an evidence review process. So I'm on the um, Centers for Disease Control's Guide to Community Preventive Services Task Force. One of the force, and one of the things we do is we do evidence reviews, and then we review evidence reviews. So I end up covering topics um, as as wide as um, alcohol, um, uh, car safety. Right. smoking, diet, yeah. Yeah. by reviewing those evidence reviews and, yeah. and, you know, and really looking at evidence tables, what goes into it, yeah. um, I find that I am much better able to stay on top of multiple fields than I, than I ever could otherwise. So I'm like thrilled to be mm -hmm. part of that kind of a process. And, and I think you know, none of us are going to be able to read all the papers anymore. It's just there are yeah. too many papers and too many journals. Yeah. And, and really using evidence sources to, um, to read mm -hmm. the synthesis reviews on an ongoing basis, whether it's using Cochrane Collaboration right. or one of the other ones, the guide, I, I think is really important because in the end, we kind of want to know, well, what's the evidence in a field? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I tell um, a large employer who uh, wants to do worksite health promotion? Um, what do I tell them about what works? And, and so often, that's what we want to know. Um, but also, I, you know, I, I mean that that certainly will do some of it, but it doesn't do all of it. I'm also trying to get away from just being dependent on my paper journal. So when I see an article that I want to read, I flag it for myself, and then I send it to myself um, right. electronically, which may not be the most efficient, but you know, but it's one way of managing it. And then when I go on a plane, or I download it, and so that I've got. Right. Um, you know, I've always got backup articles. I mean, one mm -hmm. way I manage it, I think I manage information, is like I'll, I never go on a trip without having, you know, a, like a large, un, you know, unread yeah. stack of things, both electronic and physical, because right. in a way, we're, we have to read more widely. I mean, mm -hmm. we're in, now we're in an in interdisciplinary world, and, you know, if I want to communicate with people in genetics, I have to know enough about genetics to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. If I want to go down the hall and talk to, you know, the scientist who's working on synthetic vaccines, um, I need to know something about what he's doing. And so um, I find that more and more I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reading broader and broader. Um, and then, I mean, you do have to try to put it all together. This notion of uh, evidence reviews is really a, an important one, and, and one that I think has uh, added uh, kind, of, kind of a new a new layer of, of uh, important information uh, uh, to us. Uh, the Cochrane reviews are, are the ones I'm a little bit familiar with, and they're just amazing. They uh, are, and and uh, this this is um, perhaps a, a pointer toward uh, uh, new kinds of information services uh, that require not only the the, the deep understanding in the domain, but also how do you organize and manage this so that it can be uh, made available to decision makers like yourself. Exactly. And also, Gary, 
how do you use people in your organization to help you scan information? Mm -hmm. When I was um, at the Cancer Institute where I ran a large division, it was really 1997, it was at the beginning of the period in which it looked like the internet was really going to have a big in yeah. impact on patients. Mm -hmm. And I felt overwhelmed by wanting to know, you know, well, what's coming out on, you know, this month or mm -hmm. next month. But I didn't have enough time. I was running a $400 million division. Right. And so I brought somebody in who was very, very smart. And um, she had had some library experience. And I said, what I want you to do, Paul, is I want you to be my guru for information in this area. And your job is to go out and find mm -hmm. the Pew reports and this report and that report and right. to find the listservs and, um, and so that you can bring it back to me, you know, forwarded electronically, printed, whatever, so that I can know what I need to know without spending all my time on the search. And it was fantastic because we knew we're we knew all the latest reports. We saw, we could see the trends. And over time, there were more than 100 people who were signing up to subscribe. And we never advertised it or anything, but they right. heard, you know, I talked about right. what Paula had brought me. Yeah. And I wish I had a few of those people in different areas because yeah. um, having people whose job is to do that kind of information mm -hmm. scanning and, um, and, you know, maybe even for librarians, helping people to know how to be the information guru in different areas. Um, because I need to be an expert on different topics, but I don't have time to be the expert on all right. those topics. And I think thinking about, you know, it's sort of like having a bot that could go out there and, and find exactly. it all, but right. sometimes you need a human being, right? Right, right. You know, who can really mm -hmm. synthesize and, and also use their human connections to get people to inform them about sources of information. And we shouldn't, you know, in this internet era, era we shouldn't undersell the importance of those human connections, I think. It, right, to especially um, also establishing a relationship of trust and understanding your needs uh, uh, it would be part of that as well, so it works both ways. Absolutely. That, yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion, and, and uh, I, I think that what, what we used to call um, uh, SDI services, Selective Dissemination of Information yeah, Services, right. are on their way back in, in more sophisticated ways. Well, so, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I think the, the, the evidence reviews are, are one, uh, one kind of them, but they tend to be done by the, the, the true experts in the mm -hmm. field. That's but, true. Uh, how we find the intermediaries who are able to uh, uh, take advantage of those things and, and synthesize them is, uh, is really, I, I think, a, a long-term uh, challenge for us. And, uh, certainly will keep our field uh, uh, busy for the foreseeable future. And I think ILS uh, should be alive and well for a very long time with information mm -hmm. needs because um, it's, um, our, I think our appetite has grown for information, don't you? Absolutely. Well, this is, um, this is really uh, quite informative and, and useful. Um, any last um, uh, words of wisdom? Well, I think um, I, I would just say that, you know, one final kind of information mm -hmm. that or not final because mm -hmm. there's yeah. probably no yeah. final, but more and more, we just had a meeting before this meeting about how to use information from various sources across the university mm -hmm. to make better decisions about trends, um, mm -hmm. what kinds of grants people are applying for and success mm -hmm. rates and all those kinds of things. And so I think more and more um, leaders are going to be, are, are going to be on the line to really think across their organizations and talk to one another about what kind of information do we need to make better decisions. And in the end, I think if we can use information to help us be smarter, to make better decisions, to run organizations more wisely, we'll all be better off. Great. Well, thank, well, thank you very fun. much. That was yes. fun. It's always good to 